Hello everyone and welcome to the Battletech Guide for Chasing the Kerensky Rank. I'm your host, Colors Fade. As you can see from the screen here, I finally managed to achieve this rank with a whopping 120 days left remaining in my career run. And as some of you know, I don't like to make guides or tutorials for games unless I feel like I can speak with some authority about them, but after finally achieving this rank, I think it's okay to share with you my methods, strategies, and rules that helped me complete this. In the YouTube description box below this video, you'll find timestamps to the various sections of this guide, so feel free to use those to skip around if you want. You'll also find links to Google Documents for Excel spreadsheets and maps that I used while I was doing this career run. I will describe and go over those documents in detail later on in the guide. For now, let's get started. The obvious place to start this guide is with the difficulty settings I used, so let's go take a look at those. The difficulty settings determine how your point score gets calculated. The highest multiplier you can have is a 1.0, and you cannot possibly think to achieve the Kerensky without it. So you need enough options turned on to give you 1.0. The settings at the top, as it says, can only be modified at the game start, and some of these are worth a lot of points. Iron Man grants you 0.2 points right off the bat, and so does Unequipped Mechs. Unequipped Mechs um, means that when you get Mechs salvaged and they get assembled, they don't come with any weapons at all, or heat sinks or anything. That's fine. Be totally okay. Mech parts for assembly. You can raise this number and get higher um, point totals on this, but <clears throat> there's no way to achieve Kerensky without it. You have to have that set at three. I think this is pretty standard for anybody who's chased Kerensky. They know you gotta, it takes three mech parts to assemble a full mech, but it costs, it gets you zero points as far as the difficulty multiplier. I randomized the starting mechs just for fun, just to make each new career different. Also reduce Argo upgrade costs. I do not have this checked. And the reason is because you don't need to. It's just not necessary and it's not gonna, the points aren't taking these points away, 0.5, you need that. All right, scroll down to the rest of this. Enemy force strength set to hard is worth one point. It's actually worth 0 0.10. First of all, you need the 0 0.10 to get to the total score multiplier, but also harder enemies mean you're going to run into heavy mechs sooner. And we'll talk about that later on. Um, when we get into the early game strategies. The problem with running into heavy mechs sooner is you don't have the mechs or the pilots to tackle them and they can chew you up, but I have a strategy to mitigate that. So the good news with harder mechs is since you see them earlier, you can salvage them sooner and you can build up your forces sooner, but you have to have a way to kill them. So again, when we get to this section on early game strategy, we'll talk about that. Advanced Mech Warriors I have set to rare so that you can get the 0.1 score on that. You really don't need Advanced Mech Warriors. Your Advanced Mech Warriors are going to come from your initial pool that you start with by them not dying and gaining experience and you poking points into their skills. They're going to be your best Mech Warriors by the end. You, you just don't need to find Advanced ones along the way. And the reason is because I also have a strategy for how to build up your pilots as the game progresses, so we'll talk about that later on. Contract payment is set to normal and salvage is set to generous. Generous buys you no points, but you need generous salvage because you have to assemble mechs and sell them to earn enough C-bills to reach the Kerensky score. Salvage at generous is an absolute must. Contract payment at normal is something you can have. I advise not trading this and setting it to stingy so that you can get points somewhere else because you actually need this money in the very early game and I will talk about that strategy as well. It's very important to have this cash. Uh, Mech Warrior Progression is set to normal. That buys you 0 0.05. Mech Destruction and Lethality basically go hand in hand. Mech Destruction means that when your center torso gets destroyed, the, the, the mech is, uh, well, Lethality means that when your center torso gets destroyed, your, your Mech Warrior dies. Mech Destruction says when active, this setting will cause any mech disabled by the destruction of its center or torso to be lost permanently. So you lose the whole mech. So both of these things are bad if the center torso blows up when the setting is enabled. Mech warriors that are incapacitated in combat will always be killed. 
you never ever want your center torso to get destroyed. If that's going to happen, punch out. Punch your pilot out of your mech and eject. So you can safely get 0 0.2 points by selecting these. They sound way worse than they are. And I turn on, uh, it says no rare salvage and I don't have this checked. You actually want the rare salvage. And the reason is because this is how you're going to get things like plus plus LRMs and um, plus plus other weapons like auto cannons. You absolutely want plus plus weapons that do stability damage. Stability damage is one of the best things in the game because knocking down mechs and getting free headshots that don't cost you any resolve is super helpful in allowing you to acquire enough salvage to get the Seabell score. So it's really important. All right, that gets you to a difficulty multiplier of 1.0 and that'll help you attain your Kerensky rank. Out of all the things you have to concern yourself with on the career scoreboard, there are only three goals that are really troublesome. Everything else will complete more or less automatically just by playing the game. The three things you need to focus on are sea bills earned, star systems visited, and maxing out your positive and negative factions. As a goal to shoot for, once you have your heavy and assault mix lined up, which should happen sometime between days 900 and 800, you should be able to make 10k toward your sea bills score every 100 days. Don't ask me what this is in actual sea bills, how many millions it is, I don't know. I don't pay attention to the dollar amount, I just watch the score. If you're not making 10k towards your score every t every 100 days, you're off target and you will probably miss it at the end. Sea bills and star systems visited give people the most trouble and for good reason. They gave me the most trouble the first few times I tried career mode. But I came up with a set of rules and strategies that made both of these easier to obtain. So let's talk about the most important rules and tips first and then we'll get to the other details later. The rules I came up with were non-negotiable. There were times I wanted to break them. A couple of times I deviated from some of these rules and usually when I did, I paid a price. These rules helped me to achieve the Kerensky rank, so I think they matter. Rule number one, buy partial mech salvage. This is the most important rule in helping you attain the Seabell score. At some point in time, you're gonna establish an nest egg, a few million Seabells in your bank account. My guideline is simple. As soon as you acquire 20 million Seabells in the bank account, begin buying every single partial mech salvage you can encounter in every system you visit. Why, you ask? Because once you purchase three parts for a mech, Yang will assemble it into a completed mech. Then you can stuff it in storage. Now, first off, this helps you finish the mech weight class completion part of the score. But the real benefit in all these duplicate mechs is that they can be sold off for Seabells. And every Seabell you earn goes towards your Seabell score. Something a lot of folks don't quite grasp is that the score only counts Seabells earned. You don't get penalized for spending money. Thus, spending money to make money is a viable strategy. And the absolute best return on your investment is partial mech salvage. Every mech you put together is basically gold. As an editorial note, I do not believe it's actually mathematically possible to get the Seabell score high enough without buying the partial mech salvages. If you rely only on the mechs you find during battle, you'll probably fall short. It's just not possible to gather enough full mechs to sell to earn enough Seabells that way. But if you gobble up every single partial mech part that you can find in the stores and sell off the excess completed mechs, you can achieve this part of the Kerensky rank. Rule number two, keep pirate and capellan faction is as high as possible for as long as possible as a corollary to rule number one pirate systems are golden because they offer two stores to buy partial mech salvage from the regular system store provided your faction is good enough with whatever system you are currently in and the pirate store and the thing about the pirate store is they will frequently have more partial mech salvage than the regular store and they will also have assault class mech parts, which earn far more money than the other mech types. Whenever I encountered a pirate system, I emptied it of all its partial mech salvage. I bought it all, and I'm convinced it made all the difference. The same is true for the Capellan faction. Eventually, you want to tank Capellan faction and bring it down to a minus 100, because the four easiest factions to raise to 100 and keep are Draconis, Steiner, Merrick, and Davian. However, 
For the vast majority of the game, you want to keep Capellan high, at least high enough to allow you to buy partial mech salvage pieces without incurring a penalty, which means a score no lower than minus 19, which makes them indifferent to you. The Capellans have the most territory to farm for missions, thus it pays to be able to purchase mech parts from them. If you can't buy the partial mech salvage because your rep is bad, then you're basically screwed. So get in good with the Capellans and only tank that faction at the end. And believe me, it's pretty easy to tank them because nearly everyone has missions that target them. Rule number three, do a lot of your traveling early. In the early game, you have only six mech bays and crummy pilots with no skills. Your mechs are small and both your pilots and your mechs are going to get battered doing missions. On top of that, you don't have enough medical or repair points yet, so healing injured pilots and repairing damaged mechs takes time. Given that you're going to be wounded for long stretches, take those days and pass through as many systems as possible and improve your star system's visited score. This will save you the stress of trying to find systems in the late game. I completed my star systems visited component with 128 days remaining in my career run, and that's by far the earliest I've ever achieved it and I know it's because I focused on traveling early. Rule number four, travel smart. Take the short approach in. Knowing how to take advantage of the way the game handles travel distance is really important. It takes three days to activate the jump engines and jump to another system, but the actual travel time from the jump point to the system is variable and is also affected by the Argos engines. This is why it's important to upgrade the Argos engines as soon as possible to shorten this travel distance to the minimum amount. But beyond that, you can shave days off that travel time by being smart about how you land in systems. You never want to fly directly into a system, even if you intend to land there. The reason is because you pay the full cost of the travel distance. For instance, if it costs six days to travel to a system, and you decide to fly directly into that system and land to do missions, you spend the full six days traveling to that system from the jump ship. But if you set up your path to fly through that system, then pause the game as you reach the system and change course to visit the system, you reduce the travel time to three days. Always and forever, it will be three days for every system that you do this on. Now, this tactic only works for the ride into the system. On the way out to the jump ship, you pay the full cost. So if it's six days, you'll spend all six days traveling from the system to the jump ship. However, if you take advantage of the three days in trick, then you shave a huge number of days off the time you spend visiting systems. I stopped at a total of 72 systems. Imagine if all of them took five days to land on, which they don't because many take longer than that. But let's say they all take five. By shaving the approach time to three days and cutting off two days of every single system using the pause and change course trick, I saved 144 days of travel time. Do you see why I achieved Kerensky with 120 days to go? Rule number five, travel smart part two, know your systems. Hand in hand with taking the short three day travel time to each system is knowing the systems and traveling to the ones with the short travel distances. I will provide a link to this map in the comments below and I apologize for not knowing who to credit for the original version. What I did was add color coding to this map to make it easier for me to plan my routes. The color coding is related to the travel distance for each system. Blue systems are systems that take six days or less to travel in and out of. These are the systems you really want to target for doing missions. And of course remember to plot your way through them, pause and change course so your inbound time is only reduced to three days. Yellow systems take between 7 and 10 days to travel in and out of. Um, now, obviously, you can cut that down to 3 days on the way in, but if it's a 10-day system, you're still spending 10 days getting out of it, and those extra days add up. I don't want to tell you not to stop at them, but you should be really cautious because the extra days add up. Basically, you don't want to stop at these systems unless they are Goldilocks, unless they're perfect in terms of missions, factions, and stores. Red systems take the longest to travel to and should absolutely be avoided. Now you'll also notice some purple and cyan circles around these systems. The purple mark pirate systems and the cyan denote star league systems. Star league systems are where you're going to find lost tech, things like Gauss rifles. 
products. I like to at least target these systems to fly through so I can pause and inspect the stores and see if I want to drop down and buy anything. Hopefully also being able to do all the missions. Now the key with this map is you want to be able to land on as many blue systems as possible and clear out all the contracts while only landing on yellow systems if you absolutely need to and totally avoiding the red systems. The only thing you want to do with a red system is pass through it and get it for the star system's completion score. Out of the 72 systems I stopped at, only 9 were yellow systems. And the only reason I landed on those systems was because as I flew over them and paused to inspect their missions and stores, I found they had perfect mission composition with perfect faction results. I mean, they had stores that contained items I desperately wanted, like ultra auto cannons or ghost rifles. Frequently, these systems would boost some critical faction, like Pirate or Capellan, so I'd begrudgingly drop down into them and clear them out. But that's sort of a rule. Don't stop on a yellow system unless it's a Goldilocks, unless it's darn near perfect. Also note, when stopping in blue systems, don't stop for anything less than four missions. Don't be dropping down to do two or three missions and then leave. That's a waste of time, at least in the mid-game. In the final 300 days, due to tanking, compelling, and pirate faction, you'll have a hard time finding more than four missions in a single system. But for the bulk of the game, before you tank, pirate, and capel in faction, try and only stop in systems with full missions, and then do them all. If you have to take a tiny faction hit with someone to clear them out, fine. Just don't take too much of a faction hit. We'll talk more about faction management later. For my successful Kerensky run, I stuck almost exclusively to blue systems and didn't waste my time on anything else. This allowed me to complete 72 stops by day 120. Rule number six in the early game, take the cash. During the career setup you saw I set the salvage to generous and the payout to normal, but in the early game you do not want to worry about salvage. The money is far more important for several reasons. First, since your pilots can barely hit anything, let alone headshot something, and since you don't really have the equipment to go sniping anyway, you're going to destroy most of the enemies you face, and you're not going to get a lot of salvage out of it. And the salvage you do get will be small mechs, like locusts, commandos, and javelins. Mechs that won't help you build up your arsenal anyway. You're far better off taking the cash. You might be tempted to take the 313 salvage on an assassination mission, thinking you're going to down a heavy and get all the parts. Don't do it, just take the cash. For one thing, having cash means you can afford to travel, and remember what we said at the beginning of this guide. Travel early, get those star systems out of the way. To do that, you need a bank account to pay your team. So, take the money. But also, you can outright purchase your first heavy mech if you just take the money and run. Marauder 3 parts exist on nearly every system you see. Gobble them up and you'll have a fully assembled heavy long before you can luck into killing one or acquiring the necessary parts through mission salvage. Rule number seven, stick to the half skull systems until you have a heavy mech. It might not seem like it, but in the beginning of the game there's actually a huge disparity in difficulty between half skull starter systems and one skull systems. The missions really are harder by quite a bit, especially since the difficulty is configured for an enemy force strength of hard. On those one skull systems you're going to be see teams of medium mechs and the occasional heavy and you're simply going to be outgunned every time because you have two medium junkers and a couple light mechs. Don't risk it until you have a heavy. Now I tried to start the career mode all kinds of different ways but what I found the most effective was to stick to the half skull starter systems until I could purchase my first heavy mech, typically the Marauder. Once I have a heavy it became safe to venture into the 1 and 1.5 skull systems. Until then you're simply better off flying the distance to the other half skull systems and collecting star system visits for the point score. Don't be overly brave or think you need to punch above your weight. You don't have to. You have time to go slow and cautious and build your arsenal smartly. Here's the thing. You don't have to be in a rush to get a heavy mech via mission contracts. I visited five half skull systems before I finally had what I needed to move up to a one skull system. At day 1056 I finally had my first Marauder built and at day 1034 I was able to start clearing systems reliably of all contracts. I did my first four skull system at day 718 and cleared it of all contracts. That's when things really started to roll. 
On two different occasions, early in the game, I tried to jump to higher skull systems before I was ready. I learned the hard way. Stick with the half skull systems, because you can successfully complete all those missions for the cash. Even if you only have six junky mechs in your base, that money is everything. If you try to venture into the 1 and 1.5 skull systems before you're ready, you'll just get your mechs destroyed, lose pilots, and you're still going to have to spend a lot of time flying around in space to get everything repaired and everyone healed. So just stick to the half skill systems until you have that first heavy. One final word on this. You are never going to make any real money in the first two to 300 days of a career run. It's just not going to happen. The money's not there to be made. You lack the pilots and the mechs to do it. But don't worry about it. Instead of being concerned with the money you're not making, worry about setting yourself up to make big money the rest of the way. Pilots with experience and a bank full of sea bills goes a long way. And you can do that by sticking to the half skull systems early on and taking the cash. When discussing strategies for factions, it's very important to understand the different levels of the factions because those control the levels of the skulls in the contracts that you can work. You start the game out indifferent with everybody, and that allows you to work three skull contracts. At 20 points, you become liked and can work four skull contracts. And then at 40 points, you become friendly and you can work 4.5 skull contracts. But you can't work the five skull contracts until you're honored at 80 points. That's a big difference between 40 and 80, and that's part of the problem. It's part of the difficulty in the late game, especially as you're flying around Capellan space and Upper Merrick and Upper Davian, and you see these four skull systems and 4.5 skull systems, and they're full of 4.5 and 5 skull contracts. So the problem becomes when you roll into a system like this, and there are only five skull contracts, but your reputation isn't up to 80 yet, so you can't work them. And that's why it's imperative that you don't try to pre-plan where you're going to stop in the game, which is what makes routing so difficult. You have to be able to fly through systems, pause the game, and inspect their contracts to see if it's a planet you actually want to stop at and do the contracts on. You don't want to be wasting time traveling directly to systems not knowing what the contracts are. You have to inspect them and make sure that you're landing on systems that benefit you. When it comes to factions, my recommendation is to target Davian, Merrick, Steiner, and the Draconis Combine as the four factions you want to eventually raise to 100. Steiner and the Draconis Combine can be a bit tricky to get started because they have very few low skull systems to get going. The Draconis Combine, for instance, only has Lindsay and Brockway, so you'll have to visit those systems in order to raise your faction enough to do the contracts at the higher skull systems. Same is true for Steiner. Claybrook is the only low skull system that offers Steiner contracts, and it has a very long travel time of 18 days. It's the only red system I recommend you go to, and I recommend you do it early. That way you get the Steiner faction, but also you're going to have light mechs and inexperienced pilots. Your mechs are going to get hurt, your pilots are going to take wounds, and that 18 days you can spend traveling out of that system and repairing and healing. The next lowest system you can earn any Steiner rep in is Thurok, which is a two skull system. Now, the good news with this is flashpoints will provide you with additional chances to raise your faction. I don't recommend going out of your way to hunt down flashpoints, except for the Raven, and we'll talk about that later. But if you find yourself close to a flashpoint and it provides positive faction for an entity that you need, then consider that when planning your travel routes. As for Davian and Merrick, they are the easiest factions to raise because they have contracts all over the place. Merrick has loads of contracts in Magistry space, while Davian has plenty of contracts in Torian space. Raising Merrick and Davian will help you tank the Magistry in Torian, killing two birds with one stone. And since both Merrick and Davian have tons of contracts in Capellan space, you'll never have a problem raising these factions to 100. They target the Capellans a lot. The bigger and more problematic issue is what I spoke about at the beginning of the guide. Rule number two, raising and then keeping your Capellan and Pirate factions as high as possible for as long as possible. For the first 900 days of your campaign, you want to think of Capellan and Pirate factions as your most important factions. Above all else, you want to become friendly with these factions, because friendly reputation grants you access to do all the contracts up to 4.5 skulls. 
more importantly, as I said earlier, having good faction with Capellan and Pirates will allow you to buy all the partial mech salvage from both of their stores, and that's a tremendous help with the sea bills requirement. To that end, I want to mention finally the Flashpoint prototype, which provides you with the Raven mech. Giving that mech to the Capellans results in a whopping 40 faction points. I strongly recommend doing that to help with your Capellan faction. The Raven is the only Flashpoint I actually plan my travel around. All the other Flashpoints I do if I happen to come across them at the right time, but I don't go out of my way to hunt them down. Which brings me to plotting the best travel paths. Part of the issue with planning your travel route is that the systems in the game do not allow bi-directional travel. They can only be approached and departed from specific directions. The greatest examples of this are the dead end systems. There is no way to path through the dead end systems, so you can't pause and change course, thereby reducing your inbound travel time to three days. Therefore, you want to avoid nearly all the dead end systems. But beyond the dead end systems, there is the problem of directional travel. The Battletech galaxy is basically a huge directed graph, and you have to figure out the Hamiltonian path through it. That is, the path through the graph that hits every node, yet avoids duplicating any nodes. Let's go back to this map I showed earlier. The green lines indicate that you can pass through the next system from the current system. A gray line means you cannot pass through the next system from the current system. Unfortunately, due to the proximity of some of the systems and their labels, it can be difficult to determine all of the potential paths accurately. However, I discovered an Excel spreadsheet that assists in this effort. I apologize for not knowing who to credit with this sheet. If you are the author, please let me know. Like all the documents in this guide, it's available as a Google Doc and you can find the link in the description below. This particular Excel sheet called Travel Planning was not complete when I downloaded it as it was missing several new systems that appeared in the DLC. I've added what I could, but it's still incomplete. What this sheet shows is a list of all the systems you can travel through, starting at the system in the leftmost column. This is incredibly useful for plotting your routes. The issue with this spreadsheet, however, is that it doesn't show you the distances for the individual systems. So, you need to use this spreadsheet in conjunction with the map. Together, it's possible to plot routes through various regions of the galaxy that minimize duplicate visits to systems while optimizing visits to systems with short travel times and ideal conditions for contracts. Now, as you can see from some of these screenshots, I did not do my planning with any sort of fancy program or graphics tools. I wrote everything down longhand on a legal pad or spiral notebook, but this was a necessary step. Planning efficient routes is the only way to maximize the 1200 days you're given in your career. In a word of caution, don't bother trying to find the holy grail. There is not a single perfect path through the entire galaxy. The basic problem is that due to the randomness of the contracts at each system and the factions those contracts target, you must allow for some flexibility in your travel plans. Thus, I recommend only worrying about plotting the next 10 to 15 jumps taking into consideration faction reputation and the composition of your pilots and mechs. When I plotted my routes, I wanted to make sure I could stop at systems with low travel times while also maximizing both my salvage and my reputation. The biggest concern here is faction reputation. If one of my reputations took too much of a hit, I needed to have the flexibility to change my plan. Remember, in order to attain Kerensky, you're going to need a ton of sea bills, and in order to do that, you're going to need positive faction with Capellan and Pirates so you can buy their mech salvage from their stores. That's why those two factions are so important. Thus, when you're plotting out your routes, be flexible. So, how do you actually do this? First, create a rough depiction of the systems nearby that you want to travel through. Next, draw directed lines from the planets according to the map and the information on the spreadsheet. The directed arrow lets you know you can pass through the next system. Once your graph is done, you need to figure out which systems to skip over. Red systems obviously get skipped, but yellow systems you should pause and inspect both the contracts and the store. If everything lines up perfectly and you get a Goldilocks system, it may be worth stopping. Then, of course, we want to try and stop at all the blue systems unless our current group of pilots and mechs can't handle it because the skull rating's too high. With your target systems in mind, 
try to find a route that hits all the necessary planets without passing through any system more than once. Once you have a route, you set a word of the wise. If you've already completed a career run and have a fair amount of cash in your bank account, it pays to use that save file to run around the galaxy and verify that your chosen path actually works. I did that for most of the paths I plotted, just to be safe and make sure I wasn't accidentally winding up in a dead end corner. With proper travel planning, you can make a very efficient use of your time. I completed Kerensky with 120 days remaining on my career, and I managed a perfect score with 45 days left, so I know this strategy works. Finally, a brief word on pilots and mechs. I only had one rule for pilots, and that was that every single pilot had to have bulwark no matter what, because damage reduction is critical to success in this game. I also made sure to have one pilot with sensor lock on every mission because it is the only really good way to counter ECM and it is also really helpful in a variety of other situations like knocking out turrets. As far as mech builds go, that's almost like religion for folks. Everyone has their own ideas about what's right and wrong and what works for one person might not work for another. I don't want to tell anyone how to build their mechs, but I'll show you what I used. When it came to outfitting my mechs, I had a couple simple rules to abide by. First. Always maximize frontal armor on every mech, coupled with bulwark from pilots and my rule that you heard about earlier of always staying in cover, I rarely had to worry about mech damage. I always favored ballistic weapons and missiles over lasers and PPC. Auto cannons were the best weapons for me and I didn't like the damage to heat ratio on lasers. An exception to this rule were the fire starter mech and the grasshopper which I used as backstabbing rogues. With my fire starter and grasshopper mechs, I always stuck my sensor lock pilots in them and had them sweep around behind enemies and alpha strike them in the back where their armor was weak. Of course, the alpha strike makes the mech hot, but for the next couple of turns, the pilot could sensor lock and help everybody else out. But once I had a pilot with called shot mastery that was good enough to start headshotting things with the marauder, then I would stick these backstabbing rogues in storage. When it came to my weapons, especially missile weapons, I always favored stability damage over every other bonus. Stability damage can strip a mech of all its evasion in a single turn and make it unsteady, allowing for greater accuracy on called shot headshot attempts. Quite often, stability damage weapons would knock mechs down, resulting in free headshots, and that's about as good as it gets. Finally, I always put ammunition in the legs. In my opinion, it's a critical mistake to put it anywhere else. In conclusion, if you stick to four basic principles, you will have a chance to attain the Kerensky rank. First, take the short three-day travel time into as many systems as possible using the technique we covered earlier. Second, as much as you can, limit travel to systems with short travel distances. Third, maintain good relations with Capellan and Pirates for as long as you can. And fourth, buy every single piece of partial mech salvage you can get your hands on after you've established a bit of a nest egg. If you do these things, Kerensky is possible. Best of luck to you. I'm Colors Fade, and I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, consider hitting the like button. Thanks, and I'll see you next time.